this thing called science of man is based on the premise that what you think is what create, is created in your life. And we ha have a, a, an understanding of that, a mechanism that we identify that makes that happen. But the bottom line is that what you think is created into your life. And anyone that would tell you differently hasn't really studied it at the level we have. And out of that belief and understanding of how life works, we do this thing called treating. And this morning I'm calling it uh, power praying, but to be absolutely clear, I think I remember how to do this. It's the same thing as spiritual mind treatment. It is based on a power within us, knowing the truth of who we are and speaking from that awareness into life. And out of that, there's a spiritual law that reflects it back to us. And it doesn't matter whether it's a lofty thought or a dismal thought. If we think it, it's going to be reflected back to us somehow. Especially if we believe what we said. Sometimes we don't even think about it. We just have a passing thought. But we believe it and boom, there it is. You know, and we kind of lay that on ourselves and then we struggle. And we wish that life wasn't that way and we wish that we had better control. So what we have is this discipline. And it truly is a discipline. It's also what I call the crown jewel uh, of science of mind is this thing called spiritual mind treatment that we can actually discipline our thinking through using a formula to have an outcome created in our lives. Not only can we do that, but we can have the assistance of another person who has a disciplined form of thinking to assist us with that. Those are called practitioners. And they're called all kinds of practitioners, religious science practitioners, spiritual practitioners, uh, and there's other names for them. But this is the essence of who we are. Uh, uh, David Mark told me this morning that his teacher in, uh, in New York City uh, said when asked what science of mind was, he said spiritual mind treatment. And he would be right about that. He would, because that's what we do. And we do it well. And we've all, all of us that have gone to a practitioner have received some kind of benefit from it. But this is something we don't normally talk about in here other than to say go to a practitioner for treatment. If you come to our classes on Monday night, there's been many classes where Barbara or I have taught treatment and taught those what's the five steps of treatment. And I remember when I went to my first class and the teacher said, there are five steps to this process. And my first thought was, oh, I don't want to learn five steps. I just want it to work out. Barbara wasn't impressed. So I learned the five steps. And then I was dazzled by the changes that it made. The very first spiritual mind treatment I had done for me was in that class. And, and uh, Barbara uh, told us all to get into prayer partners and to, and to work with somebody and, uh, and to not only treat in class, but to treat for that person all week until we came back the next Monday night. And it was interesting that uh, I went to, uh, uh, or my, my prayer partner was this uh, beautiful blonde woman young woman who uh, was a martial artist, had been to Japan twice to study her, her uh, martial arts and was quite accomplished in it and had a real, although she was not Asian, she was, was very uh, uh, Euro-centric in her, in her appearance. Uh, she had that, that air of the, of the, uh, the ways of the, of the East, especially relating to martial arts. And so uh, that didn't seem important as we were treating for each other. But somewhere during that week, what I had her treat for was that I had some new clothes. Because I had just come from Australia and didn't bring all my stuff and I needed to, to dress better uh, I, as I was playing in this new arena. And uh, so I, uh, I, I, my request of her was that she treat that I have uh, a better wardrobe. Well, somewhere during that week, I, I found myself in the Dayland Mall, which was the best mall in South Florida at the time. And I'm just wandering around, and I looked in the window of some shop, and there was this beautiful robe. It was a bathrobe, but it was full length, and it had long sleeves and, uh, that, that kind of hung down, and it was beautiful. And so I went in there, and I tried it on, and it fit, so I bought it. And it wasn't until I got it home that I realized that 
It was covered with Japanese symbols. I've never had a connection to Japanese things. And then now I'm walking around in a kimono. <laughs> and what I realized was that that was the consciousness of this lovely young lady that was treating me. I mean, not that she was saying, John's going to go buy a kimono, but she was in her consciousness, including things that were, that were valuable to her as who she was. And I ended up with a kimono. And I, I wore that thing for years until it fell apart. So I have no issue with it, but it was a wonderful lesson for me to realize that when someone is treating you in the way that we do it, their, uh, their consciousness definitely influences that. So I know that all of you have heard the term spiritual mind treatment, or most of you, you're hearing it now. But I would bet there's plenty of people in the room that have never done a spiritual mind treatment or had one done for them. And even if you have had one done for you, chances are you weren't really aware of the steps that that practitioner was doing. And by the way, we, we invite all of our practitioners up front every, every uh, Sunday. Sometimes they circle the room. Uh, and we invite you to take advantage of this service of them doing spiritual mind treatment for you. But... Uh, that doesn't mean that you know how a treatment works. So that's what I'm going to begin with today, is we're going to talk about treatment and what the steps are and how they work. So we begin with step one. It's called recognition. What it, could it be that we're recognizing in step one? What we're recognizing is that there's a presence. This universe did not just happen upon us. Something created it. Now, in many religious faiths, they identify that source as having human qualities, specifically male qualities. That seems to be the way it's unfolded. My favorite uh, philosopher is uh, Benedictus Spinoza. And one of the things he said was that if a triangle could describe God, it would describe God as a triangle. Meaning that we as human beings, it's really easy for us to describe the divine as being human, as being male, as being, uh, yes, all present and all powerful, but still having that, those characteristics of a human being. It's an easy place to go. We don't do that here. What we are recognizing is that that presence is everywhere and always that it's an intelligence that transcends physical form. It is actually the creator of physical form. We talk about spiritual law and how our thoughts uh, become our reality, mirrored back to us in our lives. The creator of law is that same force, that same presence. And there's only one of them. There's not two of them. There's no competing forces in the universe, just the one. And that's the thing that we recognize. And, what we, and, and I always teach in my classes that you can never completely arrive at a place where you, where you absolutely understand the divine. It's a direction more than a destination to understand this. So move in that direction. And when you do a spiritual mind treatment, know that the presence and the power of the one is everywhere, that it's absolute, that it transcends time and space that it's perfect, that it's infinite at every point. And by knowing that, you're approaching an understanding of the divine, probably more than most people on the planet. That's the work of the first step. That's where we start. That's how it begins. I've had some people say, well, I got that one down. I don't need to say that step. Yes, you do. It's essential that we start with that understanding of the presence of God. You don't have to call it God. It can be whatever you want to call it but it's absolute in everything that it is. That's our recognition step. That's where we start. This is a quote from Ernest Holmes in this thing called life. It goes like this. God is life, not some life, but all life. God is action, but not some action. Not some action, but all action. God is power, not some power, but all power. God is presence, not some presence, but all presence. God is pure spirit filling all space. That'll give you an idea of what we believe about the presence of the divine. It is absolute. Thank you, Ernest. Step two. 
identification. Some people call it unification. We call it identification because what we're doing with this is identifying the presence of the divine at the point of us. That whatever we are is what God is. That there's no separation there. We obviously, uh, living on planet Earth, being in these things that uh, uh, Ram, uh, Ram Das calls a spacesuit, come and participate in this three-dimensional world on planet Earth with these bodies, but that's not who we are. We're something greater than that. Thomas Troward said that the infinite of the divine is complete in, its, in being infinite at every point, meaning that you are the infinite presence of the divine, and so am I, and so is everybody else. Even all the people that don't know it. That's the way we experience God as an absolute in our lives as much as anywhere else. And I find myself on occasion saying in my treatment that the presence of the divine is as complete, whole, perfect, and infinite at the point of me as it is anywhere else in the cosmos. And that I speak from that authority in my treatment. And what happens? Well, by golly, the thing that I'm focused on happens because I have recognized the divine and I have determined that that is who and what I am. That is my identification point. Now here's something important to know. Don't start with step two. You walk around saying, I am God to everybody, they will lock you up. <laughs> but if you explain to yourself in your treatment work that God is infinite at every point, I am this presence. Then it works and creates in your life the authority to know what is yours to do and how it should look and how the conditions in your life should unfold. You do have the ability to do that, but it really only works if you know it and you're clear about it and you work from that place. So you identify yourself as the divine and that prepares you to, to move to the next step. But let's look at a, a quote from Dr. Holmes from Living the Science of Mind. Spirit is, spirit is both an overdwelling and an indwelling presence. We are immersed in it, and it flows through us as our very life. This is the teaching that holds us in that place of identifying ourselves as God. Hmm. So we move to the step that everybody wants to get to. We realize the truth. Now, again, other words are you, have been used by teachers around this, affirmation, declaration. There's lots of ways to, uh, to identify this step, but realization is the one that works for me because the idea is that treatment is about changing a condition in your life. And if you're treating for yourself, then yours is to realize that that which you desire already exists. It's already true. It's, think about how you would use the word realize. I just realized that this was already done, that this was already handled. It occurred to me that this was already the way it is. That's the level that you want to use in your third step because you want to realize that you're not asking anybody for anything. This isn't petitioning. This is affirming. This is knowing. And there's no work to do here. It seems like that this should be, I, I need to pray really hard. No, you don't. All you have to do is know. And if you know it's so, then it's so. And it shows up in your life according to your consciousness and according to your patience. Let it be okay when it shows up, and it'll show up fast. Need it right now? Oh. <laughs> you might have to wait a little while just to get clear. And it might look like somebody outside of you is doing that to you, but they're not. You're doing it to yourself. You're creating that. When it comes, how it comes, what it looks like, all comes out of your consciousness. I love to use the word perfection, but I don't use it in the way that we do in, uh, in polite society. P perfection to me is not about what's, uh, are meeting our expectations. And that's how most of us use that word. Oh, it's perfect. It's just like I imagined. It turned out just the way I wanted it to. It's perfect. No, that's not what this is. Spiritual perfection 
means that whatever you think is reflected into the law and returns to you perfect in relationship to your thinking. Your consciousness and your experience are perfectly aligned. And if you want a different experience, have a different thought, and you'll get a different result. Okay? That's step three, realization. Let's see what Holmes says about that. Thought, which is built upon the realization of divine presence, has the power to neutralize unwanted thought, to erase it, just as light has the power to overcome darkness. Not by combating darkness, but by being exactly what it is, light. Spiritual mind treatment works the same way. We're not going to war here. That is why some of my colleagues teach a step called denial. Even Holmes did denials. I am not attracted to that idea. I don't want to put any focus on what I don't want. I want to put all my focus on what does work for me and what I, where I, the condition I do want to experience. That's where my work is. And I don't fault anybody that does denials. Uh, I remember not early on in teaching, learning the five steps, but uh, I have colleagues who teach seven steps. There are actually some that teach 12 steps. Can you imagine? And one of them in those models is denial. But I don't want to go to war. I'm not interested in fighting with my, uh, grappling with my consciousness. I simply want to know the truth. So that's what I do. I use my consciousness like light. And I focus entirely on shining that light into my life so that that's what I experience back is light. Okay. Oh, and that's from a Holmes Reader for All Seasons, which was published more than 30 years after Holmes transitioned away from this, uh, this experience. Uh, still very powerful. I'm glad whoever found it, found it. Ah, step four, gratitude. The first three steps, by the way, were Holmes' steps. He's the one that put those together. And if you read the Science of Mind text from 1938, every treatment in the back of that book has three steps. But one of his students and a, a minister in this movement named Morin, Mo Oren Moen, Oren Moen, <laughs> tricky name, uh, was the minister in Oakland, California, and went to Holmes and said, my students want more in their treatment work. So we're thinking about adding gratitude and the final step, which I'll get to in a minute. And Holmes, always being the uh, affirming, beloved one, uh, said, sure, go for it. And that's how we got our fourth and fifth step, the fourth one being gratitude. Now, we don't do gratitude to be polite or to be appropriate. We do gratitude because gratitude affirms what we did in step three. Gratitude. Have you ever been grateful for something you didn't have? Probably not. It's, it's, it's kind of unnatural to say thank you for something you don't have yet. So if you're saying thank you or you're being grateful or you're, or you're offering thanksgiving, well, however you want to word it, you're actually telling your subjective mind that you already have it. And by the way, back in step three, you didn't treat that you were going to get something. You treat that you have it. And that's the truth. And then in the fourth step, you're going, I'm so grateful I have it. And that all supports the idea that it's reflected into your life. So that's what the gratitude is about. It's not a nicety. It's a necessity. And what did Holmes say about this? The reason we express thanksgiving is because we know from the beginning that we are to receive and therefore we cannot help being thankful. And he's talking about receiving whatever it is we're focused on. This grateful attitude puts us in very close touch with our power and adds much to the reality of the condition we are addressing. So we're grateful for the outcome that we are calling forth into our life. And it activates it and it makes it move. That's step four. Step five is called release. Now, why would we need to release it? We, we want it. We're treating it. Why do we have to let go? Here's why. If we rely entirely on what we know, this thing called our consciousness, to have the outcome we want, we're leaving out all the possibilities we don't know about. We're limiting how this can come forth in our lives. It is really valuable to let it go. As they say, let go and let God. Let the law take care of this. It's not your business how this happens. It's only your business to know that it does happen. 
You get caught in a quagmire trying to work this out by determining how it's going to be. And Holmes says that that's not the way to do this. It's to let it go. Let it go and let it happen. And it will. And it likely, if you do that, will happen by some means you didn't expect. It'll happen through a, an email or a, or a piece of mail or a phone call that you had no idea was going to happen. And part of the release is, after you do the treatment, is to not go back to trying to figure out how it's going to happen. It's, it's about acting as though it's already so and doing the preparation work. Edwin told a great story years ago that I loved. He, uh, he wanted to have a new piano. And he was doing his affirmations, and they were in unity, so they weren't doing spiritual mind treatment, but it applies. They were, uh, they were doing affirmations that he has, uh, uh, has a piano. He had no idea how in the world he was going to get a piano. But what he did in his home was he set aside the space for the piano. He knew he wanted a baby grand in his home. So he moved his furniture around and created that space. And on the floor in that space, he put his sheet music. And he pro I think he actually put a, a candle. I don't know if it was a candelabra. It may have been at the time of Liberace. I don't know. But he, he made the space for that camera, or for that, uh, for that piano. And out of nowhere, a great aunt called him and said, uh, you know, I've got this piano that I've had for years. It's a baby grand. My fingers really don't work well enough for me to play it anymore. And it really should be somewhere where it gets played. Would you like it? That's how it works. And if he had said, I'm going to get a baby piano because I'm going to save up my money and I'm going to take on an extra job and I'm going to do all these things to get my piano, he'd have been working for years at this. But simply by claiming it so and letting it be and releasing it, he got it in perfect time. That's how it works. Let's see what Dr. Holmes says about release. I let spirit take care of the universe and my affairs. Well, I release all responsibility, and I am at peace. Not bad, huh? And that comes out of the science of mind, the book. So the idea here is it's not, and, and don't misunderstand the word responsibility. He's saying I don't have to go through an arduous task of getting there. I simply let it be. And the clearer and cleaner you can let it be, the better it will show up, the faster, the clearer, and likely by some means you hadn't planned. So that's spiritual mind treatment, five steps, five steps to create the things in your life. This is disciplined thinking. And by going through those steps incrementally, the outcome is assured. And you might say, well, I've, I've treated for things and didn't get them. That's because you didn't believe your treatment. If you'll believe your treatment, you'll create the outcome that, you, that you're desiring. And please understand, you can't stay at the level of desire. That won't get you anything. That just all you will get from, from wanting. And, and wanting is important because it shows you what you want. But if you stay there, all you'll get is more wanting. So the idea is to know the truth about who you are, who God, what God is, not necessarily in that order, and then to take that want and turn it into a have, a clear have that you can be grateful for and you can let it go and let it happen. That's how treatment works. Honestly, pretty simple once you get it down, but incredibly powerful. Now, most of, of us here in this room work with a practitioner when we do something or are thinking about working with a practitioner. Sometimes it takes a lot to approach somebody in the front of the room uh, when you've got something going on in your life. But I want to give you some guidance this morning on how to address a practitioner, how to know what to do here. Now, I would encourage you to, to do treatment, and if you, if you uh, want to get all this, it's clearly, clearly in a book called Five Steps to Treatment in our, in our bookstore. But beyond that, go to a practitioner and listen to what they say and recognize those steps and join them in that knowing. It's not that you have to join them in the knowing, but it helps, it's nice, it supports the idea. All you really have to do is believe that when the practitioner says it, it's so. 
That's the, the limit. Uh, that's the, 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 the thing that you have to at least go to to have the outcome that you want. But what you're doing with a practitioner is you're allowing them to lend their consciousness to your life. But there's a couple of other things that I've been working on for years that I haven't talked in this room about at all, and it's important, and I think it's time. And the essence of that is that when we go to a practitioner or when you're on my treatment list or Barbara's treatment list and you tell them what you want, there's some things that you may be asking for that I want to recommend you not ask for because I don't think that works. And what that is is asking for something in your consciousness to change. Asking for a, a character trait to change or an emotional state to change. And it's really co very common for people to ask for these things. Why do we do that? Well, first of all, we do it because we have self-judgment. We think we don't have enough courage or enough happiness or enough, uh, golly, I wrote a whole list of stuff, uh, enough confidence, enough courage, enough kindness, enough peace, enough generosity. We don't think we have enough of that. Or we think we maybe have too much of things like, uh, let's see, upset or selfishness or anger or fear. And we want a practitioner to take those away. That's not a practitioner's job. A practitioner cannot change your consciousness. That's your job. So don't ask for those things. The practitioner can change a condition you're experiencing. That's what a practitioner does. The changing of conditions through spiritual mind treatment. We think that if we have more courage, that we'll have the courage to go get the job we want or be in the relationship we want. But that's not it. You ask the practitioner to support you in having that relationship or having that job or healing your body. Practitioner, that's where this thing started was in physical healings. And practitioners are very good at that. We've had great success with people being taken to hospitals. If blood's involved or, or sirens, we, we know that we get right on it. And all of our practitioners join in if a member is experiencing something like that. And we've had great success with it. So yes, health issues, um, injuries, uh, being whole and healthy in that regard, absolutely can, is the work of the practitioner. But the practitioner can't change you. That's your work. That's my work. Our work is to understand who we are and to grow in that understanding. And the thing about these conditions, especially these attributes like peace, or power, or any other attribute that we want to claim for ourselves is already inside us. We already have it. We have not been denied any of that. The only thing that denies us is that we get into the fear game and we think we're not good enough and we're not playing uh, the, the game like we are the powerful, incredible beings of, of divine essence that we are. That's ours to remember. So what a practitioner does is model the changing of conditions for us. And change, conditions will change. But the thing is, if we don't change our consciousness, we'll eventually go back to having the condition that we had before. And we'll go, oh, it didn't work. Well, it did work. It worked fine. You just either couldn't see it, or your, your staying with what you believe took you back to the other condition or something like it. Maybe it looks different. Maybe it's a different person. You know, that thing that, that, some, that I've heard people say is that well, I've been married four times and it feels like every time I get married that my ex-wives are coaching my current wife on how to be in a relationship with me. No. The common thread there is that you've chosen these people. They're the same in that regard. So we tend to continue to create over and over conditions in our lives. The practitioner models for you that you can change it. You can change those conditions by simply having different thoughts, different beliefs. And when you do, your life changes. There's one other thing that I want to coach you on in working with a practitioner. When you come up and get what we call a one-minute miracle on Sunday morning or on the, uh, our, our circle uh, morning on third, third or fourth Sundays where we where practitioners circle them when you go to them and you say, no with me that, 
when you're done with them. Ask them to treat for you all week. They have no obligation beyond that minute they spent with you. But invite them to treat for you the rest of the week. And then find them and contact them and let them know what happened. And you could say that's ego that wants that to, to be known by a practitioner. But I always find it helpful to affirm, to, to learn that, that what I treated actually turned out. So consider doing that as well. But understand that a practitioner is valuable and helpful. You don't need to be afraid to tell them what's not working in your life. Sometimes we think that if we get the thing, I think I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. If we, if we get the change to our personality, to our affect, to that part of our lives, that that'll, that's all we need to have the thing we want. I'm telling you, go to the thing we want. Go there and get that. Because that's where you want to go, isn't it? So this is spiritual mind treatment. This is what we do. It's what we do really well. And I invite you to either get a book, come to Barbara's class, or go to a practitioner and use this in your life. It is extraordinarily powerful and meaningful and helpful to creating the disciplined thinking where you create the life you want. And when you do, your life will change in a really good way. And then you'll be hooked on treatment because that's what we do. I love you very much. God bless you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Barbara Waterhouse. And I'm John Waterhouse. Thank you for watching this message today. Through our website, cslashville.org, we have over a thousand messages, classes, and new thought books all to download at no charge to anyone. Producing this incredibly valuable collection of ideas is really making a difference in the world. It's changing lives everywhere. Please go to our website, cslashville.org, and click the Donate button. You can support this life-changing ministry, and when you do, we'll send you a note of thanks and also put you on our daily prayers. By doing this, you're helping to raise the consciousness of people across the entire globe. We're changing lives together, those lives that are being more prosperous, more healthy, and more joyous. Thank you for being a part of this important work and supporting what we do here at CSL Asheville. Thank you.